Hello everybody and uh, welcome back to this afternoon's session of the Climate Challenge Fund uh, gathering. I um, hope you enjoyed your lunch and a bit like me managed to maybe get outside for a quick walk uh, to get some oxygen. Um, it's great to see so much interaction on Twitter and indeed the chat box right across uh, the event and uh, we're just gathering some of those fantastic pictures that some of you have sent in both of the views from your window and also of your lunch. I have to say mine was so unimpressive that I decided absolutely not to do that. So those of you who've done it, thanks very much. Very brave. Um, delighted also to just jump into one or two um, of the particularly the tabletop discussions and get a bit of a flavour of the, the kind of discussions you're having. And it's, it, it's very clear to me that uh, George's input this morning really helped stimulate some of that conversation, which is exactly, exactly what we hear to to do and, and promote but equally excited uh, about our next speaker Michaela Loach um, who's going to speak to us about uh, climate emergency justice and uh, race and I guess bringing so many important and um, very topical subjects together into so a single presentation I think it's going to be fascinating for all of us. Michaela is a climate justice activist and co-host of the Yikes podcast so please subscribe to that a podcast about all things sustainability, including climate change, anti-racism, refugee rights, and how many of the sig significant social environmental issues of our time are interlinked. She's based in sunny Edinburgh, where she studies medicine uh, alongside of all of that activity. Extraordinary. And Michaela has recently been featured talking about the climate emergency on BBC News, as well as the magazines Elle, Vogue, The Herald, and Eco Age. So absolutely delighted to introduce Michaela's talk. Hello, my name is Michaela Loach and I'm going to be giving a talk on the climate emergency, justice and race. So yeah, it says my name there as well. Anyway, um, I am someone who like talks a lot about these issues on Instagram. Um, I'm a climate justice and anti-racism activist. I've been involved with groups like Climate Camp Scotland and Extinction Rebellion Scotland and I co-host a podcast called The Yikes Podcast and all of my work centers around trying to make um, climate conversations more inclusive and more intersectional. And I'll be defining what all these different words mean. And this presentation will basically, and this talk will basically just be an introduction um, to climate justice and anti-racism and why those things are so essential and will hopefully kind of open up some of those conversations to people as I will define key terms. Um, oh yeah, also I'm a medical student, but that's kind of my, my side thing it seems. <laughs> So definitions, I'm going to start off by just defining some key terms and that's going to be basic, but like the basis of this presentation and there'll be time for, um, for questions afterwards. So I'm hoping that this will mean that everyone can get on the same page. If you already know what some of these things mean, hopefully talking about them will like be a good refresher, um, but I just thought it'd be good to get everyone on the same page. So something that I refer to quite a lot is BIPOC as a phrase. So BIPOC um, stands for Black Indigenous People of Colour. It's a way to describe people of colour um, that I personally like um, because it basically emphasises that the Black and Indigenous experience is quite different than other experiences of communities of colour. Um, there are other phrases that are used such as BAME, but I prefer BIPOC, especially in relation to the climate crisis, as I feel like it emphasises the people who kind of we need to emphasise most as well. So that's something that I'll refer to. So if you hear me say BIPOC, that's what I mean. Um, systems of oppression is something that I also refer to quite a lot. So systems of oppression um, can basically be loads of different things like white supremacy, patriarchy, cisgender and, heteronorm and heterosexual um, normativity, um, the class system and so many more things are all systems in our world which oppress some people and privilege others. Um, these systems of oppression result in discrimination and harm that we see through racism, transphobia, classism, um, sexism and so many other things and ableism. Um, and systems of oppression are systems, they're more than just interpersonal things. Um, and there are ways in which um, individuals who hold marginalized identities are oppressed in some ways. Um, and it's really important that we keep this in mind as we do our activism and we do our climate work. So climate justice is the principle that I hope all of us are building our climate work on. Um, it's a framework which understands how the climate crisis impacts people and is dependent upon systems of oppression, as referenced before. People are not e impacted equally by the climate crisis. 
So climate justice is a principle that goes beyond just talking about sustainability um, as sustainability of an individual or as sustainability um, in regards to nature or the planet. Climate justice sees that the climate crisis is not just um, an ecological issue, but it is a human issue too. It sees that um, systems of oppression and the ways in which people are marginalised intersects with the climate crisis. A good example of this is shown through how I got into climate activism, which was I was more involved in mig migrant rights um, advocacy and refugee rights advocacy. And it was actually through that lens that I started to care about the climate crisis more because I realised that um, the climate crisis is going to be the biggest force of um, forced migration that the world has ever seen and the biggest cause of, of displacement. And that if we don't tackle the climate crisis, um, then we're going to have all these other issues um, and, these pe and people will be harmed in so many ways. And therefore, we have to see the climate crisis as a social um, issue as well. And we have to tackle that, that social issue um, by creating a more equitable world for all people. Um, I can never say that I am an uh, expert on climate justice because I'm not someone who lives on the front lines of the crisis. Um, but there is so much information out there on climate justice and it's such an important principle that all of us can apply to all of our activism. And it's essential if we wanna make a better world for people and planet. Intersectionality. So you might have heard this word um, banded around a bit, um, but what does it actually mean? So the term intersectional was first coined by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, who is an incredible um, lawyer. She's a black woman in the US um, who was involved with cases specifically around um, sexual violence um, towards black women. And she realised how black women are oppressed in very different ways, not just because they are oppressed as being black and oppressed as being a woman, in almost like a almost like a sum added together it was that it created a whole different way of being oppressed and a whole different way of being marginalized um and so in relation to our work and the work of climate justice it's a framework which recognizes the interconnected nature of social categorizations such as race class and gender as they apply to a given individual or group regarded as creating overlapping and interdependent systems of oppression so it's a way in which these different um social categorizations overlap and depend upon each other and are connected and that we cannot um, see them on their own. They have to be seen in the context of everything. Um, so it's a framework which recognizes that multiple systems of oppression exist and we must acknowledge them in all of our work. And if we are not intersectional in our climate work, then we open space for oppression. And that's why intersectionality is so essential um, to all of our work. And you might have even heard of intersectional environmentalism, um, which is a movement that started during this summer um, by um, Leah Thomas, who's building off Kimberly Crenshaw's work and the work of so many climate justice activists. But intersectional environmentalism and climate justice are pretty much interchangeable. And intersectionality is so important because if we aren't being intersectional in our work, then we just open space for oppression. So colonialism. Colonialism is something I'll touch on as well, um, because it is so inherently connected to the climate crisis that we exist in today. Um, colonialism is a practice of domination, which involves the subjugation of one people to another. The British Empire is one of the biggest colonial forces in history, and the legacy lives on today. Um, too many of us are not taught about this in school. We're not taught about this in our history classes or like pretty much anywhere it's ignored. The British like history of colonialism is celebrated or just completely ignored. And colonialism was built upon white supremacy. It was built upon racism. Colonialism is the framework for extractivism, which I'll go into in a minute, and which has caused the current crisis we're in today. If you think about why one group of people feel like they are entitled to oppress and harm another group of people and another group of people's land and livelihood, um, then you can understand why colonialism is built upon white supremacy. And therefore, if we're gonna get onto extractivism, but if all of this is so connected to the cause of the climate crisis, if it's the root and the foundation of the climate crisis, how could we ever do climate work without also addressing systemic and institutional racism? So neocolonialism. So neocolonialism is the use of economic, political, cultural, or other pressures to control or influence other countries, especially former dependencies. So it's basically new colonialism. Um, examples of these are seen in the fossil fuel industry, working in many previously colonized countries, causing damage to both people and the natural world in these countries. 
Um, examples of this are shown as Shao working in the Niger Delta and they in Nigeria they have not only harmed the natural world there and have created huge oil spills but they've also um, murdered activists who've been fighting to protect that land um, and yeah and then also another example is um, UK coal giants in Colombia um, so UK coal giants so coal the coal industry have rather than um taking coal out of the ground in the uk now because people don't want that to happen they realize the harm that can cause to waterways and our communities they've now just outsourced that um to create the harm somewhere else so they're going to take coal out of the ground in colombia and that pollutes the water systems um, of indigenous communities and they basically are using the the um they're using money and influence and economic power in order to harm another community and almost and just outsource the harm elsewhere so that people in the UK can live a better life and so that people in the UK can have less domestic emissions and domestic harm. But if the harm is happening elsewhere, then you have to ask yourself, why do people think it's okay for these things to ha happen there? And this is all of this is why climate justice is so important. Okay, next one, extractivism, which I mentioned before. So extractivism is a process where natural resources are removed from the land or the underground and then put up for sale as commodities on the global market. It's an economic model which compromises both human rights and the planet. It's the manifestation of neo-colonialism. Extractivism is what puts the lives of indigenous people at risk. So extractivism is basically the model in which the fossil fuel like industry exists today. It's a model which basically extracts um, parts of the land um, for profit and makes that into commodities. Extractivism is, is what has caused the climate crisis because fossil fuels are the root of all of the problems that we exist and then fossil fuels and extractivism industry have been built off colonialism and built off white supremacy. I think you might be seeing a theme here. Um, but all of these things are so completely interconnected to systems of oppression and that's why we can't do any of our climate work without addressing systems of oppression we can't talk about plastic without talking about the fact that plastic is made from fossil fuels and that fossil fuels harm indigenous communities and communities in the global south um, and traditional global south and previously colonized countries we can't ignore that that industry is built on neo-colonialism, which is a legacy of white supremacy that exists today and that is perpetuated today and the harm that's put on, upon those people. So racism, um, you probably know what that means or have an idea of what that would mean, but I just want to emphasize that racism is more than just interpersonal racism. And within this presentation and when I talk about climate justice, I'm not just talking about um, people being directly quote unquote racist to each other. I'm not just talking about someone calling someone else a slur. It's talking about the structural and institutional is issue. It's talking about how BIPOC individuals are oppressed in so many ways through institutions and systems, and not just through people being racist directly to each other. It's a much bigger issue than that. And that's how it's perpetuated through all of these systems. And that's how systems of oppression are systems they're much bigger than just individuals doing bad things and that means that people are disadvantaged in a different way and then even within that when i talk about like racism and when i talk about white supremacy and when i talk about um even white privilege it doesn't mean that white individuals haven't had like haven't had doesn't mean that they are inherently um how do i say this it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't mean that um you've had an easy life if you are not a BIPOC individual it just means that the color of your skin hasn't made that worse and that's what I mean when I'm talking about this um okay ecofascism so ecofascism is something that you might have heard about or you might have not heard about um but it's an ideology that marries white marries envi environmentalism and white supremacy it blames the environmental crisis on overpopulation which is a myth um and I can break that down a little bit it suggests that the solution is genocide or forced sterilization of BIPOC communities. And examples of this have been seen um, in the Fujimori government in Peru, forcibly sterilized indigenous women under the guise of um, population control, basically saying that these women were causing um, the climate crisis by um, having too many children, that population was the problem. But when we make population the problem, the answer is less people. And in, to many people that um, is very harmful. Um, for example, in the population bomb, which was basically one of the first um, papers to come out around po population control, um, it's quite a harrowing um, read just because the things that are said by these white men about um, 
these women is and these these communities all, all of them focus on communities of color in the global south um is just really quite awful um one thing that was said in in these papers has been that um the solution they say that as they see um population as a problem the solution is to send an atomic bomb as that would be kinder um to these communities which is harmful and awful and is not a solution to the climate crisis overpopulation is not a cause of the climate crisis um and to, to blame it on overpopulation really lets these 100 companies that are responsible for 71 percent of all greenhouse gas emissions off the hook um in reality when we look at per capita emissions the countries with the highest population growths do not have the highest emissions and um, it's actually a lot of the countries like in the uk or the us or a lot of um traditionally global north countries that have much higher emissions um per capita and therefore the problem isn't peep too many people the problem is wealth inequality the problem is like capitalism and our economic system as it exists now and choosing um to blame it on things that whistles to eco-fascists that whistles to racism um is very problematic and we should really really avoid that wherever we can um and there are more um, examples of this there's a yikes podcast episode podcast episode four um talks about eco-fascism and the dangers of it um and i'm happy to like answer questions about that as well but i thought i'd pop this one in as a good um a good definition that you should probably know if you don't already you probably do <laughs> um so environmental racism um black indigenous people of color are more likely to experience the impacts of the climate crisis so this is in so many different ways. If we look at um, even what which countries um, globally are experiencing the most adverse effects of the climate crisis, those countries are like majority BIPOC countries. Um, if we even look domestically in some countries like in the US or the UK, the communities that experience the most um, harm are often communities of color. In the US, um, there's a thing called redlining, which I'm not sure if people have heard of, if you have heard of, but it's, um, basically this idea where um not even idea it's a thing where um deliberately through government and through policy um communities of color were deliberately positioned next to environmental like hazardous places ha environmentally hazardous places it's a way of segregation in the u.s still existing today and being manifested today and in many ways the u.s apparently is still as se segregated now as it was in the 60s through things like red redlining and other things like that um it's basically a system in which yeah BIPOC communities are placed next to them, these harmful places um, and a majority of Americans living near hazardous wastes are people of colour and black Americans are three times more likely to die from exposure to air pollutants than their white counterparts. So that is a section that's from um, my friend Leah Thomas who founded Inter Intersectional Environmentalism's article for Elle where she talks about how this summer people will probably heard or will have heard of um, the fact that George Floyd died saying the words I can't breathe or he was murdered while saying the words I can't breathe and that um is so resonant for so many BIPOC communities all over the world because not only can these communities not breathe because of um racism and because of the oppression of systemic racism but also they can't breathe because of pollution being in their communities even in the UK um the like there are people who have died from asthma and pollution related um inequalities um and a lot of those people have been BIPOC as well um and I'd really recommend looking into environmental racism but in the UK context as well um there's also almost like environmental classism which is an issue as well but class and race intersect as well um if you look at which communities experience these issues the most but if you also think about the climate crisis as a holistic whole thing um and wonder how why is it that these countries that are majority BIPOC um are being allowed to um, experience all these really negative effects when they've contributed the least to this crisis. So, for example, in the UK, um, sorry, in Rwanda, um, someone's carbon footprint in five days is the same as someone in the UK's in a whole year. And yet countries like R Rwanda and other countries on the African continent are experiencing um, the adverse effects of the climate crisis today. Um, it's not something that's going to be in the future for them. It's happening right now. And so I think we need to think about like, why has a crisis been allowed to get this far? Um, and it's because it's only, it's not only harming, but it's majority harming um, BIPOC communities. And that is a manifestation of racism. So racial justice is climate justice and climate justice is racial justice. We cannot separate the two. I feel like I've, I hope that through defining those terms, I've explained a little bit as to why 
these things are interconnected and why we need to include racial justice work into climate justice work. As are the climate crisis that we see it today, as our um, crisis that we're existing in, the crisis that we're all trying to fight with our work, as it was built upon a legacy and foundations of white supremacy and racism, we cannot tackle the climate crisis without also tackling racism. If we do, then we're going to end up in with having the same inequalities and the same injustices. With my work within the climate movement, um, I've experienced people saying to me that talking about racism um, is detracting people from the real issue of, of the climate crisis, that it um, just distracts people from the real issue. But I th think I really need to let people to think about the fact that if you say that, then what you're saying is that you don't mind if we still have a racist world, but maybe our emissions are lower. You're saying that um, my life and the lives of so many other BIPOC individuals um, are not important to you and that what is important to you is preserving the world for a, for a small group of people. What we should want to do is create a better world for everyone um, and creating a better world for everyone takes us looking with an intersectional lens and working out how can we dismantle oppression as well as dismantle the climate crisis and how in our solutions can we make sure that we are being just and intersectional as well. And that's why I think that the climate crisis also presents a great opportunity um, for greater justice in the world um, because the Lancet, um, so I'm a medical student and health is something that I really find interesting and care about a lot. And the Lancet's climate and health report in 2009 they stated that the climate crisis was the greatest threat facing um, humanity today. But in 2015, they changed that phrasing to be that the climate crisis was the greatest global health opportunity facing the world. And the reason of that was because how the climate crisis um, manifests in people is also, and how it impacts people is dependent upon these systems of oppression that I've talked about before. And therefore, if we tackle the climate crisis, looking through a lens of how oppression is harming people, and create solutions that tackle both of these issues, then there are so many co-benefits for health that arise. Um, Hilary Graham, who's a scholar around um, the socioeconomic impacts um, and inequalities of health, talks about how um, health, socioeconomic inequalities become written on the body as health inequalities. And you can see that in so many different ways, but also that means that if socioeconomic inequalities become risks on the body as health inequalities. If we tackle the health inequalities um, with an intersectional lens, we can also tackle the socioeconomic inequalities. And so with any issues that we're looking at, we should always think, how can we create a better world for everyone and not just a better world for a small group of people? So racial justice should never just be theoretical or an add-on. It should be put into everything being done. It should include education in our groups and organisations. It shouldn't be something that's seen to detract away. It should be something that is central and essential to everything that you're doing. Um, I think that when we do the work to unpack racism within ourselves, it manifests itself in the work that we do. And it, doesn't it shouldn't be ever be an add-on. It should be that it is central to everything that we're doing. So in the climate movement, at least in my experience, we talk a lot about being in solidarity with groups. We talk about being in solidarity with indigenous groups or in solidarity with migrant rights groups. But if that doesn't materialize into physical action, then what are we doing? Talk to BIPOC communities and ask what they want and don't assume what racial justice means to these communities. And be, being in solidarity means doing the work, even if it's not convenient. It means doing the work um, that these communities actually want um, and making sure that you're always asking communities like, how can we support you rather than just assuming what they what support means to them. So for all of this, if you're wondering, what should I do? Um, Anti-racism work is essential for climate justice. This requires individuals to do the work within themselves as we make up these systems that oppress. I think often like we'll look at society and be like, why is society like this? Like. I wish we could change society, but we as individuals make up society. If we also change ourselves and change um, the oppressive natures that we have in ourselves that we might not be aware of, but everything that I've talked about, white supremacy is something that exists um, within all of us, whether we know it or not. It's something that we manifest un in so many ways. And if we're not disrupting white supremacy, we're just upholding it. And that's why active anti-racism work is so important. Um, and resources I've recommended here are the Me and White Supremacy workbook by Leila Saad, Nova Reed's anti-racism courses, Jess Malley's anti-racism courses, Intersectional Environmentalist and David Lammy's Climate Justice TED Talk, which is only 10 minutes and is great and will be a really good way to send to maybe other people in your groups or your movements um, to teach them about climate justice in a very short and succinct way. But 
basically unpacking white supremacy within ourselves is important for dismantling systems of oppression, the systems of oppression which have created the climate crisis. Um, and it is climate work, anti-racism work is climate work, um, and justice work is climate work. And what we should want to do, as I've said before, is create a better world for all people. And we have the opportunity to do it with the climate crisis. Yes, we can focus on like all the awful things that happen with it, but we can also focus on um, being active hope ourselves and being active hope um, can be in so many different ways, but it also definitely means creating a better world for everyone. Um, so I really hope that um, you've understood maybe a bit more about some terms. I feel like too often um, in these conversations, people feel excluded because they don't understand what people are talking about. Um, and that we've, I hope you've enjoyed unpacking that a bit. And on you can find me on the Yikes podcast. I'm also going to be answering questions after this um, where we talk about all these things. Um, yeah, thank you for listening. Michaela, thank you so much. Um, no worries. I, I think I think there's a kind of stunned silence in the virtual room here. You've you've filled our minds with so much to think about and, and so much that's incredibly weighty. Um, just a reminder to people that we we're going to be continuing to explore this issue tonight. For those of you who've been able to book, uh, we'll be watching a, a film that unpacks these issues, um, and we'll certainly want to share. Um, some of those resources that you've suggested. So for those of you who didn't catch that in Michaela's slide, we'll, uh, we'll um, be sharing those later on. Um, so um, a sh quick shout to the hall, please fire your questions to Michaela. There are one or two coming through, which are great, but um, now, now's your chance to, uh, to ask Michaela a question. So um, uh, Michaela, I, I suppose the, the obvious question in the room, we're a network of people who are involved at grassroots level on speaking to ordinary people about climate change. And um, a lot of that is kind of quite practical. It's about your mm. heating bill, it's about getting on your bicycle, it's about not throwing out your food scraps. And we've kind of, we maybe steered away from this because it's difficult to talk about and it's and it's painful and maybe we feel un unqualified. Um, so what I guess I guess what people are looking for is kind of practical steps of things that we could do in those very sort of ordinary contexts and very ordinary projects mm. to bring this issue into discussion and to, to do it in a in a helpful way so i mean it's a bit of a generic question but any any insights into how people operating at that level can 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 do that practically yeah um i think something that like i mentioned in uh, the talk was just how much doing the unpacking of white supremacy and doing like personal anti-racism work is so important i think that when you start doing that work so when you start like unpacking it within yourself when you start reading about like how you can unpack it that will just kind of disseminate into the rest of your life and into all the other work you're doing so whether you are doing like practical work about getting people to change energy providers or practical work around like the energy systems if you're doing that with like a anti-racist mindset then it will like anti-racism will feed into everything that you're doing i think um it's like a practice, it's not just an add on. Um, and I think that when you like have started doing that work, like with yourself, it will just kind of seep out. Um, it's, I wish that I remember who said this quote, but it's the like, once you know, you have the duty to act. And I feel like without the knowledge, without the understanding of, of what racism is and how it operates and how to unpack it, it's much harder to act on it. And I do think that like, you don't have to be qualified to be able to talk about this stuff. But, and to start doing anti-racism work, but knowledge and like understanding that stuff does really, really help. And it means that it will just, yeah, it will just like manifest in different parts of our life. Um, it's like really practically, I would really, really recommend doing an anti-racism course, like one of the ones that was mentioned before. And then that will kind of equip you to go out into spaces and to recognize something that you might not have realized was harmful, is harmful or like, and how to respond and how to do the like decolonizing of our own minds as well as of other people. Um, so that's why I'd like really, really recommend. Thanks, Michaela. Um, another question which I'm sure a lot of us wrestle with, which is, you know, as, as a white person, um, with all the privilege that goes with that and middle class and educated, um, how do we overcome maybe a fear of speaking about something that we, we don't feel mm -hmm. we, we haven't internalized it we're maybe not representative we're worried about saying the wrong thing we're worried about getting it wrong we're worried about about speaking on behalf of another community that we don't really understand mm -hmm. and i wonder if that if that 
if that puts many of us off going going into the space i mean how, mm-hmm. how how would you how would you advise those of us who are nervous about maybe trying this and getting it wrong i think the the first thing i would say is you will get it wrong <laughs> like all of us get these things wrong all the time but especially if this is something that um if it's especially if it's like an impression that you don't experience personally you will get it wrong but i think we need to get more used to like to getting things wrong i think as probably if you've come to this you probably see yourself as a good person in some way and i think that sometimes this view of ourselves as good people can be kind of can get in the way because when we see ourselves as good people um we find it really hard to see the ways in which we can cause harm and we're afraid of causing harm so much that we we won't even kind of take the opportunity that we could be helping because we're afraid of causing harm if that makes sense I think that's why a lot of people, especially a lot of white people, don't get involved in anti-racism work is that they're worried about getting things wrong and they don't want to get things wrong. But if the option, like even if you aren't doing, even if you aren't, you don't think you're doing active harm, if you're not being like actively anti-racist, then you're upholding a system that oppresses people and you're upholding white supremacy. And so like, I think that allowing yourself the space to realize that get it get that you can get things wrong and getting things wrong but also not being so fragile as to get things wrong and then never do it again um like that's it's important so it's important to know that you're going to get things wrong be open and willing to being called out by people um and to be like held accountable by people who do experience that so say that you do something and it was wrong and then someone who is a person of color or a black person in that situation is like hey that actually wasn't the right thing to do. It's like being open to that is so important. And I think it's hard because yeah, as human beings, I don't think we wanna, we don't wanna do things wrong. We're scared of getting things wrong. We're scared of all that stuff, but in not doing anything, harm is still being caused to communities. And so I think that like, just realizing within yourself and a lot of these anti-racism courses that I've recommended um, and Leila Saad's Me and White Supremacy talks about this as well, about like how we need to kind of get rid of that, like fragility that stops us from doing anything and that um prevents us from from like actually doing anything at all um so i would say yeah just get used to getting things wrong be ready to be being called out um be open to like recognizing you might have not communicated things in the right way but be willing to do all of it anyway because that's how we'll get collective like liberation and that's how we'll tackle the big specter of racism in this society Thanks, Michaela. That's that's both encouraging and challenging. So, so you're not you're not letting us off the hook with that fear of getting it wrong. But, but I think what you're saying effectively is, please go ahead and, and be ready to get it wrong. And I suppose you know many of us have grown up right from right from infancy being being told about the importance of getting things right, and we're frightened to say the mm-hmm. wrong thing. But, um, but I think you've you very clearly encouraged us to come out of our shell, be be ready to get it wrong, and be ready to learn. And I love the comment from Rose uh, in in the chat box, which basically says you have to practice. And the only way we yeah, can do this yeah. is by practicing. we're we're learning a whole new skill and a whole new vocabulary, and we have to learn. Um, yeah, and when you get things wrong, you learn so much more. I feel like you learn more from getting things wrong than you do from getting them right a lot of the time. Um, and also within all of this, like make sure that you are like constantly asking the communities who you're talking about, like how they want to be represented rather than like assuming what's the right thing to do. Sorry for interrupting you. <laughs> oh, that's that's great. And and there's some comments in the chat absolutely saying, we learn by our mistakes. Um, we learn mm. by, by stepping out. Um, a, another, I think, important question that many of us will think about, We most of us are involved in running projects, running organizations. We have positions of influence within in those organizations. They have their own cultures. How, what advice would you give to those of us who have that kind of influence about how we can shape um, a welcoming culture, an anti-racist culture, and an inclusive culture? Not not just thinking about our own kind of individual mm-hmm. um, actions, but going back to that point you made earlier on about structures and systems. But but actually, many of us in this room are quite privileged in having space and mm-hmm. power to shape the systems and the structures in our families, and our neighbourhoods, and our communities. So, thinking about organisations and, and projects, how how can we create? Um, positive anti-racist cultures in those organizations Mm -hmm. yeah i think um a big part of like creating those cultures is creating cultures and situations where it's safe for people to um communicate where they might have experienced harm um and so creating a culture where 
you do have processes where people can express um, in a safe environment that like they've been harmed by X, Y, and Z and that they'll be listened to in that way. But also I think um, something that I found in my own experience in like climate organizing, especially, is that in groups where um, there almost wasn't from the outset a like focus on having an anti-racist culture and an anti-oppressive culture, when issues of racism would like eventually come up, like inevitably because of the world in which we live in, um, they weren't prepared to like deal with those situations because it hadn't been like in ingrained into every part of the organization. Whereas in groups I've been in where immediately like in meetings, there will be people will talk about, um, at the start of a meeting, people will, will introduce themselves with their pronouns and they will, and there'll be conversations around microaggressions and how to avoid those. And there'll be a clear like stance of um, that it's actively, anti-racist and there's actively there will be processes to which to remove people that cause harm from those situations and there's education being put in about these issues like throughout the groups as well in those organizations when issues have happened it's very clear where everyone stands and it's very clear um how this kind of culture of anti-oppression is being is being kind of put out there um so i would say that like ingraining these things like throughout your organization is so important so it not just being a box ticking exercise it not being like okay we're going to do one training on anti-racism and then we're just because it's trendy and then we're going to leave it and like not come back to it it's like how do you maybe you do have like a group that like consistently will be involved with getting people to do trainings like consistently about different things around anti-racism maybe it will be about reaching out to communities in your own community that aren't represented in your organization enough, like black and brown communities or like other marginalized communities and asking them like, hey, how can we support your work? Because that's also what anti-racism is, is like actively doing things. Um, I think it's just like fostering an environment where um, defensiveness is almost like left at the door um, when it comes to people raising issues, especially around oppression, because I think, yeah, as I kind of kind of linked to the last question, um, we're all like when we get things wrong, we get in, like a very defensive as almost like a protection mechanism. Um, but when if you want to create a culture in which people feel comfortable um, to bring up these issues, then they need to feel like they'll be listened to and heard and not just like reactively responded to. Um, and so kind of creating that culture and a safe culture is really important. It's something that's difficult and I don't think it's like as easy to explain as I can do in like the last minute. Um, but I do think that investing in anti-racist education um, within your organization is really important. Thanks, Michaela. And again, we will share um, links to some of the resources that you've mentioned for those that, that didn't catch that. Um, I think many of us here are quite practical people and one of the things that we do quite well in our communities we learn from each other and we, we look at where a community is doing something well, a product's doing something well mm. and, and, and learn from them. And have you got examples you could point to as, ideally within Scotland but certainly within the UK yeah. where there, there are climate change initiatives going on at grassroots level and um, where this is this kind of whole systems approach is being done is being done really well that, that we could go and look at and perhaps learn from? Yeah, so um, I was previously involved with Climate Camp Scotland, which if people haven't heard of it, it's like it's a direct action group that's associated with Moss Moran Action Group based in Fife, um, who are organising around kind of trying to like tackle the fossil fuel industry in um, in that area and especially the plant that exists um, that's owned by Shell and ExxonMobil in Moss Moran. Um, and basically Climate Camp Scotland was set up um, to try and support um, action that's already happening in Scotland against the fossil fuel industry and to try and promote a future of climate justice. And because of the pandemic, the camp itself that was meant to happen had to get cancelled. And so there was discussions that happened around like, say, so where do we go from here if the camp's being cancelled and we see there are other marginalised groups that are being harmed disproportionately from this pandemic? How can we actually put climate justice into action? Um, and then what they've done kind of instead recently is they're still obviously supporting Moss Moran Action Group and still doing actions through that way. But they've also been supporting um, refugee organisations based in Glasgow because they've recognised that um, during the pandemic and everything that's happened, um, migrant communities have been impacted quite significantly. And so they did a fundraising like cycle um, where they cycled from Edinburgh 
to Moss Moran and they worked with this um, refugee rights organization in Glasgow and they raised money for them. And they also have been doing a lot of education within Climate Camp Scotland around migrant rights and migrant justice, um, and especially recently around um, deportations and things like that. And like doing education around that. And that shows, I think to me, that shows an example of being like, we're not only just theoretically in solidarity with these groups, so with like marginalized uh, groups um, of migrants who are majority um, black and brown people who've been displaced. Um, we're not only like theoretically in solidarity with these groups, we're going to be actively in solidarity with these groups, even when it's not quote unquote like convenient. We're going to go out of our way to like reach out, to proactively work with them and to highlight the links that migrant justice has with climate justice. Um, and support their work and that's something that i've seen has been like a really good example of just being like we actually do care about this issue more than just as like a performative thing but as a like a kind of more deep thing and this is what climate justice is and i think that's been like one example that i really like um earlier on in the conference michaela and um, we started off with um with george marshall talking about the importance of story and narrative and mm. uh, one of the table talks i was involved in we were looking a bit more at this issue of, of global justice particularly. Um, and um, I'm very conscious that a year from now, hopefully we've got the world coming to Glasgow and to the COP mm. conference, and there will be a very significant delegation from the global south coming to talk mm. about exactly and coming to make these points. Um, what opportunities do you see there for um, grassroots organisations in Scotland to kind of exploit that opportunity to give space and airtime and platforms to those voices to let those narratives and stories out um mm -hmm. any thoughts on how we can make the most of, of that that opportunity that's coming quite soon yeah i think that um sometimes we'll separate this idea of like the kind of global the struggle that's happening in the global south of the climate crisis and what's going on here but they're actually so interlinked because so kind of also linking back to um, Climate Camp Scotland and working with Moss Moran Action Group and um, at the plant. And so Shell and ExxonMobil, so Shell especially, um, have also been involved with harm um, and abuse of the Ogoni indigenous people in Nigeria. And one thing that's been uh, like happening a lot with Climate Camp Scotland as well has been linking with communities um, in the Ogoni community and like trying to have like communication between these communities and like solidarity with these communities and like trying to highlight the shared struggle that exists and i feel like it depends on what people's groups are about but um within whatever your group is i'm sure there will be some sort of connected or shared struggle when it comes to the climate crisis with um these other groups that are th all over the world and i think that trying to form connections is really really important because it also means that when you amplify their story um and amplify is the word rather than like you should always want to amplify and make make someone else's voices voice just louder rather than trying to speak for someone else but um like ampli amplification will be more effective if you like really understand um their story and if you can connect it and there can be some sort of relationship there um so i'd say like cop's going to be obviously a really really good opportunity because the whole world's um i don't know eyes will be on glasgow and that will be really really great um it's a great opportunity yeah for us to like l show that it's a shared struggle and it's a collective struggle um i've been reading a book for like quite a little collection of essays by angela davis called freedom is a constant struggle where she talks about like the interconnectivity of struggles all over the world with each other and how if we just like communicate more with each other on a, on a global scale that we have the opportunity to do because of social media and things like that then we can show that um all of these issues are interconnected and that when we like work together and when we communicate these together we can also kind of put out a story that is so engaging to people to be like oh wow there's a plant that's the flaring is really impacting people in um moss moran in scotland but also the same company are also impacting communities in nigeria as well and like their struggles are are linked they're not maybe not the same but they're linked in different ways um i think showing that like interconnectivity of struggle is something that's really powerful um and making those connections is important um michaela i wish we had another hour to talk to you there's um stuart ritchie in the chat has just made this really interesting point that much of our hope yeah. for a green revolution is actually still based on extractivism um, the, mm. the, the factors that we hope will power our, our cleaner transport um, are going to involve chemicals extracted from other parts of the world. So we've just scratched the surface here, but thank you so much for opening our eyes 
um, to, to all of this. And um, yeah, we'll certainly want to share those links you've mentioned. And I would encourage people who want to reflect on this more and uh, to follow Michaela and to listen to much more of this through the Yikes podcast and the other places that she's communicating. So um, Michaela, that when, when I said at the start, there was a kind of a sort of stunned silence in the hall. A, a number of people said it was it was applause. Um, so <laughs> I know from the chat that many people have, have have really appreciated all that you shared. So so thank you so much. Oh, thank um, you so for much that. for having me. Thank you, Michaela. Um, okay, we move now to our final uh, breakout slot, uh, where you've got a chance to go back and revisit the workshop that you really wish you were at this morning but couldn't get to. Um, so another forty minutes of workshops. And um, you know what to do by now. You know, please not to click the blue button uh, when you arrive there. Um, after that, we've got a, a short break and then we're back um, at 20 to 2 sharp for uh, our Climate Heroes session where we interview three amazing people from the front line of community climate action in Scotland. So enjoy your final workshop and we'll see you back here at 20 to 3.